Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. I'm Ben Radford and I'm joined by Isaac Nellist. We're both journalists for Green Left and we're going to take you through the news from across Australia and around the world. And if you haven't heard of Green Left, it's a people-powered media project that's been running for more than 30 years. We centre the voices of activists and provide an alternative to the corporate media. Become a supporter today at greenleft.org.au. Before we begin, we acknowledge that we're recording on stolen Gadigal Wongal land. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Green Left is committed to supporting the struggles for First Nations justice across the country and around the world. So thousands of people joined annual Palm Sunday rallies across the country on April 2, demanding permanent protection for refugees and an end to offshore detention. This year's events also had an anti-war theme, pointing out that wars create refugees and condemning the AUKUS military alliance and the $368 billion nuclear subs. Despite the calls for peace, Labor and the Coalition have showed their bipartisan support for warmongering by voting together to block a bill that would have mandated Parliament to vote on whether or not to go to war. Green Senator Jordan Steele-John's private member's bill would have amended the Defence Act so that Parliament would vote on going to war instead of just the Prime Minister deciding. Yeah, so while Labor and the Coalition continue their bipartisan drive to war, there's been growing anti-war voices on the streets. On April 5, about 100 protesters gathered outside the Novotel Hotel in North Wollongong and rallied against the war industry and the AUKUS alliance. The protest was sparked by the proposal to build a nuclear subspace at Port Kembla, a decision that would hamstring the port's commercial viability, destroy jobs and put the people and environment of the Illawarra region at serious risk. Another rally will be held on May 6 as part of National May Day rallies, calling on the nuclear subspace and the AUKUS alliance to be scrapped. Another peace action happened outside a bullet factory in Benalla in Victoria, where activists blockaded the weapons factory who provides munitions to the police here in Australia as well as internationally to Indonesia where they've been used to attack West Papuan civilians. Spokesperson Zelda Grimshaw said that the weapons companies are quote making a killing taking black lives while driving dispossession and enforcing ecocide across our region. While the growing anti-war movement on the streets is a source of hope against the militaristic war drive another question is the role that elected representatives can play on all levels of government. So uh, at a motion presented to Marybeth Council in Melbourne on April 12, Socialist Councillors Sue Bolton and Monica Hart called for a nuclear-free Marybeth, making the council a nuclear-free zone. And they drew in a long history of local councils declaring themselves nuclear-free zones, including Sydney City Council, Brisbane City Council, Fremantle and Wollongong Council, to name a few. The motion also included the council declaring its opposition to the Port of Melbourne being used for nuclear subs, and opposition to nuclear waste dumps and the $368 billion submarines. Yeah, it really goes to show the importance of having socialists in elected positions like Hart and Bolton. And they also successfully presented this motion to council to reject a proposed apartment building in Brunswick, in Nam, that would have blocked a neighbouring home's access to sunlight. Um, so the seven-storey building would have overshadowed the neighbouring family's home and left them with just two hours sunlight a day. Thousands of construction workers from the Construction, Forestry, Mining and Energy Union, the CFMEU, along with other unions, took to the streets on April 5 for a national day of action called by the Building Industry Group Unions. Thousands walked off the job in Nam, Mianjin and Warang, calling for action to deal with the cost of living crisis, wage rises and the abolition of the Fair Work Ombudsman, an ideological police force that targets construction unions. The Warang March focused on banning the use of silica in construction products. More than half a million workers are exposed to silica dust every day which can lead to silicosis and other serious health conditions. It's notable that unions are taking action under a Labor government and we hope they continue to mobilise for workers' rights and that the upcoming May Day rallies are well attended and strengthen the organised working class. 
Another national day of action was when thousands of LGBTIQ activists and allies marched across the country as part of National Trans Day of Visibility in support of trans rights and against transphobia. These marches are particularly important in the context of the recent attacks by right-wing groups against LGBTIQ activists, as well as hate speech from transphobes like One Nation leader Mark Latham. And climate activists have taken action across the country with more than 40 protests between March 27 and April 5, targeting the National Australia Bank, NAB, for its funding of Whitehaven Coal. The actions were organised by Move Beyond Coal and called on NAB CEO Ross McEwen to rule out funding for companies like Whitehaven Coal that are leading the world to climate catastrophe. Campaigner Renee Lees told Green Left, We flooded our local NAB branch today because NAB's ongoing relationship with Whitehaven Coal is deeply hypocritical and incompatible with their own climate commitments and a safe climate future. Then, on April 6, the Sydney Knitting Nanas and Friends protested outside Santos's Sydney office as the company held its annual general meeting in Adelaide. The Knitting Nanas called on the newly elected New South Wales Labor government to save the Pilliga and the Liverpool Plains from the risks of coal seam gas mining, particularly as Santos has not met the conditions of approval. Vigils and protests were held around the country after the police killing of 27-year-old First Nations man Aubrey Donoghue in Mariba in far north Queensland. It's reported that the police who killed Donoghue weren't wearing body cameras and it's also been announced that there'll be a coroner's inquest into the killing. Yeah, it's a terrible story. Um, Record-breaking rent prices have been recorded across all major cities for the first time in more than a decade. Rents have risen in some cities by as much as 10% in 12 months, while wages continue to stagnate. At the same time, vacancy rates have hit record lows of 0.8% in March, and it's become so common to see queues of hundreds of people lining up outside available units. Um, Rent bidding has also become more common. And in a new report released by Anglicare Australia's Everybody's Home, has found that essential workers are spending, on average, more than two-thirds of their income on rent. Essential workers have lost six hours of pay per week to rent rises and more than one million households are experiencing housing stress, spending more than 30% of their income on rent or mortgages. While the corporate media tries to heap the blame on immigrants and NIMBYism, the real culprit is the bipartisan Profits First housing system. There are real solutions to the rent and housing crisis that must be implemented, including freezing rents for at least 10 years, building and repairing the public housing stock, expanding financial assistance for low-income earners, ensuring full renters' rights and appropriating properties left vacant for more than a year. Now let's hear what's happening from around the world. The British Labor Party's National Executive Committee voted to bar former leader and left-wing parliamentarian Jeremy Corbyn from standing as a Labor candidate in next year's general election. Corbyn, who's the currently the sitting MP for the London constituency of Islington North, is the latest to the latest of these left-wing figures that's been purged from the party under the leadership of Keir Starmer. And building on the momentum of the 200,000 strong climate strike in Germany on March 3, which was part of the International Fridays for Future Day of Action, um, in which public transport workers in Germany also went on strike alongside students and climate campaigners, another transport workers strike took place on March 27. Public transport workers were joined by air, rail and water transport workers for a mega strike across 25 cities, which is the country's largest strike since 1992. It's a great sign that the climate and labour movements are uniting and it's something we should seek to replicate around the world. The trade unions and labour movement joining the climate movement would strengthen both social and ecological progress. Meanwhile, climate activists are facing heavy repression in other countries. Um, In Canada, police officers from the Secretive Community Industry Response Group have arrested five land offenders, uh, mostly First Nations women, in a raid at a camp on unceded Wet'suwet'en territory. We've talked before on the podcast about the CIRG, who are basically deployed by the government to protect 
a whole bunch of fossil fuel projects and are also responsible for a whole bunch of well-documented abuses against First Nations land defenders. In this particular case, the CIRG is repressing resistance against a gas pipeline that's being built across First Nations land. Yeah, and in a shocking attack, uh, Israeli police have invaded the Alaska Mosque in Jerusalem for the second night in a row on April 5, during the holy month of Ramadan. They fired tear gas and stun guns at Palestinian worshippers inside, and these attacks against Palestinians happen every year during Ramadan. However, this year was far more dangerous due to Ramadan coinciding with the Jewish festival of Passover and the recent election of the aggressive and ultra-nationalist Benjamin Netanyahu government. And a resolution to the Saudi-led coalition's eight-year-long war on Yemen may be in sight as Saudi negotiators travel to the country for peace talks. The US and British supported war on Yemen and the blockade has resulted in the world's worst humanitarian disaster, where more than 20 million people don't have proper access to food or drinking water. And the Saudi coalition has agreed to lift the commercial blockade on Yemen's main port, which hopefully will ease some of the humanitarian crisis. Thousands of Indian farmers who had been marching in the state of Maharashtra concluded their protest on March 18 after the government accepted their demands. The farmers had a 17-point charter of demands, including remunerative crop prices, ownership rights on forest land for tribal farmers, financial relief for onion growers and other demands. Then, a few days later on April 5, tens of thousands of farmers gathered in New Delhi to protest the central government's anti-farmer and anti-worker policies. The protest was organised by some of the biggest organisations representing farmers, workers and agricultural labourers, and it demanded relief from inflation, a legal guarantee of minimum support price on major crops, a minimum wage for all workers, debt relief, a pension for farmers above the age of 60, and repeal of the four anti-labour codes and withdrawal of the Electricity Amendment Bill 2020, among other measures. A joint statement pointed out that more than 100,000 farmers had committed suicide over the past eight years, and more than 110,000 suicides by daily wages in just three years. Farmers have played a key role in protests against the government since the historic farmers' movement in 2020-2021. Some good news in India is that the Indian Patent Office has rejected farmer giant Janssen's application for an extension for its patent on bedaquiline, which is a drug used to treat tuberculosis. This means that when the patent expires in July this year, Treatment for TB should be easy to access as it currently kills more than half a million people every year in India. A rally held by the Papuan Student Alliance, or AMP, in Bali City on April 1st was attacked by Indonesian nationalist organisation Patriot Garuda Nusantra, or PGN. The rally was calling on the Indonesian government to hold a referendum on self-determination for the Papuan people, and the AMP attempted to negotiate with representatives of the PGN, who had turned up at the rally, Uh, but talks broke down and the PGN crowd started to push the AMP group, taking their banners and throwing stones and bottles at them. Australian West Papua Association spokesperson Joe Collins said, Yet again, a simple peaceful rally by West Papuans was forced to be disbanded by police because of an attack on the demonstrators by an Indonesian nationalist group. And Jakarta wonders why West Papuans want their freedom. In another example of intimidation and repression of West Papuans, a student has been charged with treason for raising the Morning Star flag and calling for a referendum on West Papuan independence. And this was at a rally last November. And the rally itself was also met with police beatings, uh, tear gas and a whole bunch of arrests. And Myanmar Burma democracy activists are stepping up their campaign to pressure US President Joe Biden to impose sanctions on North American oil and gas companies from financing the Myanmar military coup regime's war against the people. A rally was held outside the US embassy in Canberra on March 27, demanding sanctions on Myanmar Oil and Gas Enterprise, or MOGE, uh, Mon Zin, who's a protest organiser and a, was a founding member of the Global Myanmar Spring Revolution, told Green Left that until earlier this year, 
The US-based multinational corporation Chevron owned 41% of a joint venture between MOGE and Thailand's Public Company Limited to export billions of dollars worth of gas from the Yadana offshore gas field, the biggest gas project in Myanmar. The money from the gas project is used to fund arms and munitions that allow the Myanmar junta to continue committing atrocities and brutal attacks on innocent civilians. Moving to Latin America, in Ecuador, at least 28 people have died, with dozens still missing following landslides in the country's Chimborazo province. Despite the whole region being prone to earthquakes and landslides, companies such as an Australian-based mining corporation, Sol Gold, want to start large-scale copper and gold mining there. Liz Downs, who's from the not-for-profit Rainforest Action Group, said that, quote, the tragic loss of life after these disasters demonstrates the extreme risk posed by any mining activity. And uh, in Peru, the de facto government led by Dina Boluarte announced on March 29 the definitive withdrawal of its ambassador from Colombia following statements from Colombian President Gustavo Petro in support of ousted Peruvian President Pedro Castillo. Boluarte's decision comes days after Petro lamented Castillo's absence at the Ibero-American Summit, which took place on March 24 and 25 in the Dominican Republic. Petro said, quote, Pedro Castillo should have been here, but he is in prison. They took him out with a coup. Petro has called for several times for the former president's release and has criticized the Boluarte government for violating his political rights. Petro has also been vocal against the brutal repression unleashed by the Boluarte government against tens of thousands of Peruvians who have been protesting the coup government. Looking at the more progressive heads of government in Latin America, a um, whole bunch of leaders of Latin American countries and Caribbean countries took part in a virtual summit to essentially form this alliance to face the inflation crisis that's really affecting the region. They discussed solutions to the high food prices as well as shortages in the region, as well as how to strengthen economic cooperation and trade that promotes inclusion, equity and sustainability. And then a few days after the summit, Brazil and Argentina officially rejoined the Union of South American Nations or UNASUR, which is this alliance of Latin American countries that was originally set up by former Venezuelan president Hugo Chavez to counteract US influence in the region. Argentina and Brazil had left the organization four years earlier under right-wing governments, but we can now see these efforts to, I guess, consolidate a more progressive and left-leaning block in Latin America. And you can find all of the stories that we talked about today listed in the description or go to greenleft.org.au for more. So a really exciting event that Green Left is co-hosting is coming up, and that's the Love, Art and Revolution Film Festival, showcasing films about First Nations communities resisting resource extraction, climate change activists fighting the climate crisis, campaigns for rent freezes and public housing, and activists building bridges with revolutionary movements in the global south and more. This film festival is a timely cultural injection of hope. The festival runs from April 27th to 29th and it's going to be at 107 Projects uh, in South Everly and the four sessions are going to feature 28 short films. Find out more at the Facebook event in the podcast description. Another great event coming up is the annual Eco-Socialism Conference which is hosted by Green Left and supported by the Socialist Alliance. This year, uh, a World Beyond Capitalism is the theme and it's being held in Melbourne over July 1st and 2nd and it's going to feature Japanese Marxist academic Kohei Saito who's the author of Capital in the Anthropocene. He's going to be a keynote speaker. There's going to be more details as well as more great guests they are going to be speaking. It's going to be announced soon but save the date and check out ecosocialism.org.au for tickets and more info. Green Left runs on people power. We don't accept corporate donations or advertising, so we need your support to continue. You can become a supporter for only $5 a month, and it's only $10 a month to get the hard copy paper delivered to your door. You can also donate to our 2023 Fighting Fund, which will help us make more content like this. Go to greenleft.org.au slash support to help us out. And remember to follow Green Left on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.